the original settlers, that Raleigh convinced them that if they should ever run into trouble, to go with uh, Chief Matteo, who was the chief of the of the local tribe there, uh, for safety. And apparently that first winter was pretty tough. The, they couldn't get supply ships back to the people at the colony. They had a little fort there, and they had to abandon the fort. And from that point on, nobody's found any trace of them. But uh, Willard felt, and a lot of other researchers also feel, that they followed Mantio out of the fort, hopefully to find a safer location where they could be among friendly Indians uh, and not uh, attacking Indians, and that Raleigh was using them for his own purposes, that they actually went to a a lake southeast of of Mantio on the North Carolina coast. I wish I could think of the name of the lake, but in that lake sits a lot of sassafras trees, uh, groves and groves and groves of sassafras. And at that time, there was no cure for syphilis. And sassafras, being a very rare tree, was found to be, the bark The bark could be boiled down and processed in some way where it was a cure for sassafras. And in that, uh, from that point of view, there was a lot of money to be made from sassafras. So Willard felt that Raleigh, with Walsingham's help, kept quiet. They did find out, Not he, he directed them, he knew exactly where they were. But with Walsingham's help, he sent uh, ships down there on a regular basis and had these people uh, foresting that area down there for sassafras. And a good number of them were, were wiped out by the uh, by a, a, uh, a plague that apparently one of those boats had brought up from the islands because they were, they were always en route uh, on trade along the coast of the Atlantic coast of the U.S. from the from the islands down in the mid and uh, down in the uh, Caribbean. I'm sorry, up past the U.S. coast and then and then across the Atlantic to England. So he was sending ships down there for, for sassafras and selling them for a, a quite a good amount uh, from from England. And that he and Walsingham uh, and the Queen were all profiting on that. That's that was Willard's theory. Uh, before he died. And I think that he probably has something going with that. That's also something you might know a little bit about. Have you ever heard of that relationship, that uh, situation? Yeah, that's really interesting. I've looked at uh, theories of the Lost Roanoke Colony, and uh, I hadn't heard that particular one, so I'm really curious. Um, but what you mentioned, uh, that syphilis had this impact on trying to harvest sassafras trees, I've I've been, I don't know if I want to say surprised, disappointed, or amused by how much syphilis really affects the 1500s, where I guess that's the new world's, it's a small amount of revenge for smallpox. By no means does it inflict the death toll, but syphilis just bombards Europe by the late 1400s, 1500s. Doesn't take sailors too long to spread that around, uh, all the different port cities from the new world. Mm-hmm. I read that the fashion statement of the cod piece uh, came about as a result of syphilis, where it was a place for people to keep their medicine. The British wigs that you see was a result of syphilis because one result is that you would go bald. So the wigs were a way to cover your hair. In uh, Turkish today, huh. uh, the word for syphilis, it's called in Turkish the Frankish disease because the term for Middle Easterners for a European was a Frank. That comes from Charlemagne's time. Mm-hmm. So they still call it that because it was seen as this bizarre disease that came out of the West. Uh, so that's just another thing right there that could have explained the disappearance of the Roanoke colony. So, yeah, syphilis is just all over the place in the 1500s. It, it's felt that those who survived the epidemic um, did form a community there and that they merged with the with the Indians uh, over the decades, the merge became uh, almost complete, and that there is a tribe uh, located around Lumberton, North Carolina, called the Lumbee tribe. Huh. And that tribe, huh. according to uh, researchers who have done some work out there, about, I think it's 45 to 50 percent of the surnames of the people in that tribe match the surnames of the colonists, and that they admit to and are very aware of family legends uh, that uh, that go back to those times, and they say, yes, we are descended uh, from those colonists. And the the bitter part of that, uh, the bitter part of that is the fact of how the Indians in North Carolina were treated uh, from those days back in uh, around 1600, 1587, uh, up through the 1950s. Um, here they were descendants of early 
British colonists, and yet we're given second second person status uh, all the way up through. So um, interesting story in that because you can you're able to look at it as you start to to see what happened to them. Uh, you're able to look at it from a different perspective when you know that they that they were actually the colonists. Uh, quite an interesting story and one one that deserves a movie as well. Yeah, especially uh, understanding better the early America before you get into John Smith and that whole story and everything else and see how things kick off. But I understand you have one more figure and this other person who deserves a movie is a fighter pilot. So can you tell me about this person? I sure can. I'm going to I'm going to take you to New York City at the NBC building in 1955. And there's a morning show that's very popular on television called The Today Show with Dave Garraway, who was the host of that show. And he would come into the building every morning uh, a couple hours before his show, his live show was to begin, and head up the elevator with the same elevator operator every day, uh, who was a um, a slight built uh, African American gentleman, quite old, with gray hair, uh, glasses. And on his elevator operator uniform, he would often wear a string of medals. And one day, one of Garraway's executives at NBC said, did you ever talk to your elevator operator? And Garraway says, no, I always have my mind on the show. And then one day he introduced himself and, and uh, other more than just a name. And he said, he said, I wondered where all those medals came from. And uh, this man, whose name was Eugene Jacques Boulard, said, yeah, this is the French uh, Croix de Guerre which is the hardest medal to earn uh, in France and only earned through war. It's a, it's a war medal. Uh, and I have uh, 15 others uh, that are very similar to it. And they got into a conversation, and Garraway said, oh, my God. He said, you're, you're a hero of the French people. And, uh, and, they, and he invited him onto the show as a guest. So that was quite a legendary day at NBC when they had a very mild-mannered Eugene Jacques Boulard who lived in a uh, on a walk up flat in Manhattan? Boulard's life was absolutely incredible. Uh, grew up in Georgia. Uh, lost his mother early. Family of five. Uh, at age thirteen, uh, his father, who worked at the loading docks, um, one guy had gone. His foreman had gone just a little too far, way too far, in admonishing um, Boulard's dad for whatever, and and Boulard's dad picked this guy up and threw him down into a loading bin, broke him up pretty good, and that started a lynch mob after uh, Mr. Boulard. So he got back to the kids and said, listen, I'm going to have to disappear for quite a while uh, because they're, they want to hang me. Um, so the kids were basically on their own. And not too many days after that, Eugene, at age 13, left home, wandered up... Uh, into northern Georgia, joined a gypsy camp who took him in. He stayed with the gypsy camp for about a year. And there they taught him how to fight, and they taught him a lot about horses. His dad had always told him, son, he said, I want you to learn while you're in school. And he was attending a school. And study and know all you can, and someday go to France, because that's the one place in the world you can go and be treated with respect. So he always had that in the back of his mind, and he told the gypsies the same thing, that he was going to do that. And they suggested at one point when he had his he was getting itchy to go, they said, take a train down toward Norfolk Newport News and see if you can get on a ship, and that, that you might get over there. And he went down there, and he stowed away on board a German freighter. And when, they, when, the, when the freighter went out to sea and they did find him, uh, they said, well, <laughs> you're going to have to be satisfied with being a cabin boy, but uh, as long as you do your job, we won't throw you overboard. <laughs> and they, it all turned out they liked, they ended up liking this kid because he always had a good smile and he was a hard, hard worker. And he, he was trying to pick up their language, German, which he did. And the freighter uh, made it to uh, Glasgow, actually Aberdeen, Scotland first, uh, is where he got off. And then he moved, he went to Glasgow uh, he started fighting a little bit uh, in a ring that he joined, and then they moved him on to London, and then he became a fairly decent fighter. And then he finally um, he moved he he got to Paris in France, 
and there he joined a, a, a entertainment troupe. He worked as a pickaninny, which would be a uh, kind of a lightweight uh, teenage uh, entertainer who makes jokes prior to the show. And this this show uh, troupe that he joined was called Friedman's Pickin' He's very famous all over Europe. And he got to tour Europe. He learned French, uh, and they went to all the major cities in Europe with this tour. And when he got back, um, it was 1914, World War One had broken out. And he loved Paris. He loved France. Uh, and he was just old enough to sign up. So he signed up with the French Foreign Legion and got into uh, heavy, heavy fighting in the Battle of the Psalms and others, uh, and he was badly wounded. But he said, you know, I can still walk, and I can still fly a plane. How about teaching me how to fly a plane? So he uh, went to the French Air Corps, signed up, got his license, became the first um, American-born black fighter pilot. There were some others from Saudi Arabia and North Africa, not many, but he was the first American-born fighter pilot in history. Uh, Flew for the French Air Corps, uh, shot down German planes. Um, Finally, the war ended, and at that time he went to work for a nightclub, became a drummer, and he was now uh, 20, 21 years old, and a very likable guy, a very, very responsible guy. And the owner of this one nightclub where he was drummer really liked him, had him start booking acts, and he started uh, meeting people. He would meet... In that, at that time, Paris was the jazz capital of the world. People would come from everywhere, especially the rich and famous, to go to the jazz clubs in Paris. So he was right in the middle of that jazz renaissance. And he was meeting people like, uh, like Louis Armstrong and a lot of the jazz favorites of the day. And then he worked his way up to where he owned his he – got, he got a loan and he, he opened his own bar. And then he opened a nightclub. Uh, and then he married a very wealthy white woman. Uh, she was a socialite in Paris, um, married her, had two daughters. And now it's just in, it, now it's the late 30s, just edging up uh, to, um, to a German, Germany be, becoming the power that they were. And the French underground came to him and said, listen, you understand German, you know French, and uh, there's 17,000 Germans living in Paris right now, and a lot of them attend your bar and your, uh, your gym so we'd like you to just keep an open ear and let us know whenever you hear anything. So he actually became an agent for the French underground during that time. Uh, and when uh, Germany did attack uh, France in May of uh, 40, uh, he joined the 51st Infantry. Um, and uh, within weeks, he was, in, he was in heavy, heavy fighting. He got uh, injured badly by a shell burst. And this one just about took him out. But uh, the doctor recognized him from the French Foreign Legion and uh, fixed him up and said, I can get you as far as Spain, and then I've arranged for you to take a ship uh, to New York. Now, his daughters are being protected by uh, one of the agents named Kitty, who, uh, who he had worked with. Kitty had his daughters. He could not get from Spain back into Paris. Uh, the Germans had everything locked up. He couldn't do it. He couldn't, he couldn't have done it and survived. So he took the ship to New York. Uh, settled in New York, and within a couple of years, he was able to get his daughters uh, back. But at this time, he had uh, he had accumulated fifteen uh, medals. He was uh, when <laughs> when De Gaulle came to the U.S. after World War II had ended, he uh, stopped in Washington D.C. and he wants he wanted to know where the hero Brulard was, and the the president staff said, embarrassingly said, "We have we don't know this guy. We don't know where he is," and. Uh, what do you know about him? <laughs> and de Gaulle had to fill them in, and they did uh, quite a bit of searching. They finally did find him living in New York City. And there was a strong contingent of World War II uh, veterans who had fought uh, for France and in France in New York City. And when de Gaulle came to New York City, he singled out uh, Jacques Boulard and uh, awarded him uh, and said, I want you to come to France uh, to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and uh I want you to help me in that uh, in that celebration, which he did. He also became close friends with a, a black entertainer named Paul Robeson, and Robeson was an he was an over the top activist, um, which I guess any 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 guy with dark skin in the fifties who was, wasn't afraid to stand up to people, I guess, was called an over the top activist. And there was a lot of racism going on back in those days. Robeson would have concerts, and at the concert, he was great talent. He was a great singer. 